Hello, viewers. Welcome to Doctors Health Talk Show. I'm Dr. Farhan Tahir, rheumatologist, joining you from Philadelphia. Today, it is my pleasure to welcome a close friend of mine, Evan Ticelli. He's a podiatrist and a founder physician of Independence Foot and Ankle Associates, and they practice in suburbs of Philadelphia. Uh, Evan, welcome. How are you? Oh, I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Well, Good. I have to tell you that you and my friendship goes out to when we both were young. You're still young and I'm old now, so I don't know what happened. <laughs> but, uh, okay. I, think, I think now you're old and I'm medium, I think is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, let's talk a little bit about, um, uh, about your uh, journey as a physician and, um, and as a podiatrist, uh, because many people, they don't really know what drives physicians to be what they do. It's not an easy job. It's a lot of responsibility. And we juggle between our profession, our families, and there's a lot of mystery behind physicians' lives. So I thought I'd reach out to you as a friend and go back into your early you know, school ages and what changes happen to drive you to go into podiatry school. So take us back a little bit. Sure. So, um, you know, what actually brought me to podiatry school really didn't, I always kind of thought, you know, I would end up in the healthcare, healthcare arena in some way. You know, my dad, my dad was a physician and I don't come from a long line of physicians. He's the only one in my family, but the, um, you know, but, you know, seeing the amount of effort and work that he put in, um, you know, you know, trying to help people and doing what's best for people, you know, def definitely at an early age, I, I noticed that. And I think that that really appealed to me. I always, I always enjoyed helping people and, you know, and working hard and that always, you know, being a physician to me always kind of seemed like a really good way to go about doing that. Um, you know, what flavor of doctor or in healthcare professional I wanted to be, that was, that was the part that I really, I really didn't know. You know, I, I remember asking my dad, actually, uh, very specifically, I said, you know, if you could go back and do it all over again, you know, what, what, what medical profession would you choose? And he uh, actually had some really interesting thoughts on it. He said, well, Evan, I'd either be um, an orthodontist, a dermatologist, or a podiatrist. And I said, huh, okay. So I was kind of looking at all these different professions. You know, I remember I went to, uh, to see a dermatologist, and um, I just remember, spe specifically, I remember 18, 19, 20-year-old me being kind of bored. Um, and, you know, and that's not to say, and I don't mean that to say that dermatologists don't have an incredibly hard job and are extraordinarily brilliant people and, you know, but just 18, 19 year old me was, was not, you know, particularly thrilled with this. Thrilled with that, yeah. Um, then I remember I went to go see the ortho orthodontist and I shadowed him and I just remember thinking, I can't do this because someone's going to bite me and I'm just terrified of losing a finger. That was, See, that, that was so that funny. Was, yeah. That was my very first thought. And then, you know, I went to go shadow a podiatrist and I said, all right, I can, I can get behind this because, you know, everybody that walked into this guy's office felt better when they left. Um, you know, you know, the person that I, um, that I went with didn't do a ton of reconstructive surgery, but, you know, but that, but in, but knowing that that was a possibility, you know, being able to work with my hands and, you know, um, you know, kind of effectively put things back together, which is something I've kind of done my whole life, you know, like woodworking and, metal, you know, shop, metal shopping, things like that, uh, really appealed to me. Um, you know, plus the thing I really liked is that um, in podiatry, as opposed to some, some of the other uh, professions, like my dad's, who's, he's a critical care physician, um, you know, on call is, you have to do it. Now, I currently take call, you know, and I, and I work fairly hard when I'm on call. But if I wanted to stop being on call and just do office work, that's an option. And I can make a perfectly fine living doing that. As of right now, I really like what I'm doing with, with surgery and wound care and, um, you know, the reconstructive stuff. And, you know, so that, that's, so that, that, that appeals to me still. So it's, that's still my, my preference to do that. Um, but that's kind of how I kind of like started from point A and then ended up in, ended up in podiatry. I kind of just, you know, fell into it. Evan, uh, knowing you for at least 10, 11 years, uh, I have a, such a respect for the profession you have and how much you devote yourself in taking care of patients. We have had complex patients on the floor together. 
where you are you. you are thinking of their medical problems, complex diabetes, peripheral arterial disease. There, you're talking about grafts. So you, I think you, when I see you, I was like, this physician is actually a medical physician and a surgeon in one. I I can't do any surgery. I can't do sutures anymore. But you are taking care of surgery, medicine, and then. Uh, how you marry both together, like bring them together and help solve the problem, the patients. I think people have to see you in action of how you're taking care of those patients. So life of a podiatrist. Mm. I like to know a little bit about it because I know in uh, we, you, your practice, uh, you founded a practice with your friend, a very well-respected physician that is a friend of ours. And then you grew and you continue to get busier every year. And now you brought in a third doctor. So tell us the life of a podiatrist. Walk us through a day in hospital, surgery, and an outpatient. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, we've been, um, you know, on top of a lot of hard work on our end, my, my, my business partner, uh, Warner Siegel, um, and we just um, hired a, a Harsh Amin. Um, he's been with us uh, actually over a year now. He's been with us. Um, so, day in the life of us is you know you know the way that we practice is maybe not necessarily the way that every podiatrist practices. You know, again, it's the nice thing I really like about podiatry is that you know you have people that are you know podiatrists that are employed in orthopedic groups who are you know you know spending all their time fixing fixing ankle fractures and calcaneal fractures and things of that nature you have people who are doing diabetic foot care which is you know you know, you know, tr you know trimming and clipping of nails diabetic exams you know di doing diabetic shoes making sure that people are um, you're trying to reduce uh, you know the the number of hospitalizations and um, wounds and reduce the risk for amputations um, with regard to diabetes um, the way that we practice is we kind of um, Again, we're we're both we're fortunate, which is from hard work, but also just from being um, surrounded by a, a really fantastic um, a group of um, hospital systems and other physicians that we've kind of been able to do all of it, which has been really nice. Um, you know, so like you know, for me, you know, like I, I wake up extremely early, but that's because I have a 19-month-old at home um, who likes to kick me in the face at approximately five o'clock every morning. <laughs> um, but, you know, but then um, what I'm doing on a day to day actually completely depends on the day, you know. So like, so for instance, like today I woke up, I had office at our Lansdale location in the uh, in the morning. But then I I'm at an outpatient wound care center um, associated with Lansdale Hospital in uh, Lansdale. I was um, there in the afternoons where I actually I currently am right now. Um, then tomorrow I have wound center again, office again in the afternoon. Then Wednesday Thursday mornings um, it's either administrative or surgery. You know, and what that surgery is going to be. Usually, it's going to be something on the inpatient side. Um, you know, inpatient side for us, at least in our practice, is usually like you know diabetic infections or foot infections, gangrene. Um, you know, so it's a lot of you know. In the end, we do a lot of amputations. We do um, a lot of you know draining of um, infections and abscesses, uh, debridements of large wounds, things like that. Um, you know, then we also have our completely separate outpatient surgical side, where we kind of focus a little more on. Um, it's a little more kind of like um, orthopedic style sports medicine, you know, bunions, um, ankle arthroscopies, um, you know, ankle stabilizations. Um, you know, we, we do our fair share of larger reconstructive procedures um, that are uh, kind of like, you know, what, what we kind of call like a Charcot joint. Um, and, um, you know, those are extremely complex uh, procedures that, um, you know, with high, with high uh, you know, with very high complication rates, which, you know, we have to plan for because those are really, really tough, uh, you know, long procedures. Um, like no one, you know, no one goes into, the, no, no one walks out of doing those procedures going, oh man, that was, that, that felt good. You know, yeah. it's of, it's such so a they could go for hours? How long are they? Oh yeah, usually, uh, usually for those I ballparking four and a half to five hours, usually um, in lead, you know, so those are, those are long days. Um, so, um, but yeah, but, you know, then, you know, in terms of, you know, when I actually would even get home, you know, it would be very dependent. If I was on call, it could be anywhere between eight and 11. Um, if I'm not on call, it could be, you know, between seven and eight. It really, it really just depends on, depend, depends on the day. I, as a, you know, as a physician, you know, and also as a patient myself, um, I like to give people the time they need. Um, cause you know, everyone, you know, 
everyone has their different level of need in terms of you know education or um, they may be really anxious about a procedure they need or something like that and I think people people need that time and does that push me back a little push me back a little bit and be a little late for my next patient I mean it does but I mean I think that I think it I think it helps I would want my my physicians for myself to give me that give me that amount of time if I was uncomfortable or with you know with something so yeah, yeah when I I have to tell you that um, if I'm ever looking for a podiatrist, which I think I would soon be, I'll be your patient because one well, thing that you, you have is uh, extremely good, well, um, good manners with bedside manners, and you're really pleasant to talk to. My question is, what makes what makes you unique in podiatry, or what what makes you really happy doing things that you do is in a specific area in podiatry that you actually think yourself that I'm really good at this. Um, yeah, yeah. So anything like that? Yeah, I mean that's a that's a really good uh, that's a really good question. I mean I think I'm pretty awesome. <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> so I um, someday someone's going to take me really seriously when I say that. I don't know when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. <laughs> Um, no, I, I think um, the, the thing that I really fell into um, in my career, which I think I've done, uh, I've done quite successfully, is a lot of the, um, the wound care and the healing of complex wounds. Um, you know, because there's, there's a lot of different uh, types of wounds. There's a lot of different, um, you know, reasons wounds will occur, uh, comorbid factors that can, that can affect that. And I think, I, I think you know, I, I think I've done, um, at least within my own career, a really good job of, you know, being aggressive enough, but not overly aggressive, but making sure that, you know, we're, we always have a plan of if this doesn't work, then this, and uh, have been able to do so fairly successfully because, uh, you know, a lot of the, the lower extremity ulcerations, those are really, um, you know, especially ones on the bottom of the foot with diabetes. I, I know with the patients we've had together, they're, um, they're really complex, you know, just met both medically and oftentimes the, the position of their foot, you know, so sometimes those people are going to need, um, you know, complex reconstructive um, procedures, whether they're bony procedures or skin grafts or, or tissue flaps or something of that nature. So um, I, I think, you know, being creative and working with people to um, get to get all their wounds healed, I think that's been the thing that I've been, I've been specifically able to do really well. Yeah. Uh, I hear you. You also take care of elderly population too, um, which is, uh, you know, which they need help because some of their foot deformities that I've seen, and we are in this country have aging population. And that's, that's something that needs that actually, you know, can only be taken care of by a good hearted, loving podiatrist because, you know, sometimes you just, you just need somebody to kind of come and look at them and see how bad their foot situation is. Yeah. Now, asking about your, your, your current situation, I know you hustle a lot. You have three centers, right? So where are your centers uh, where you're practicing? We were together at Lansdale and Bluebell, but I think you have two other locations now. Yeah, so our offices are at, at Blue, in Bluebell, uh, Lansdale, and uh, Percocy. So, um, so yeah, so and I'm not, I don't really go to our Percocet office very much, um, okay. but um, the, uh, so I'm mainly out of Lansdale and our Bluebell location, but we also um, cover um, uh, two wound care centers, uh, one in Lansdale Hospital and then another one down at Suburban Community Hospital in uh, Norristown, or East Norton, oh, rather. Nice, nice. Okay. Uh, so tell me a little bit about um, wound clinics. I don't know much about them. What happens there? Sure. Really good question. So wound clinics, um, wound clinics are interesting because um, the thing that really makes them tick and really makes them special is that you're you're coming you're coming in. You have a um, you have a nurse who is essentially has a certification, um, whether they're a wound ostomy nurse or some other type of wound certification, who's doing your intake and is actually we're actually following you from stem to stern with regard to your wound. And we have multiple specialties within the wound care center that we can send you to if that's necessary. So for instance, you know, if a patient is, you know, needing offloading of their, of the bottom of their foot, you know, myself or one of the other podiatrists would be somebody who they would refer to. However, if through the process of diagnosis, di you know, diagnosing, we find that this person has peripheral vascular disease, then we have a vascular surgeon that's on that's also on staff that we can refer to. Or if they have a large complex, you know, wound that's of a size that I can't graft, you know, then we have a plastic surgeon 
you know, or if there's a more, you know, complex rotational flap that I just don't have experience with, then we have a plastic surgeon that we can send them to. Um, so it's then there's other um, things that we also have um, just on top of having, um, you know, for, you know, our protocols for the different types of wounds that we have, you know, whether they're diabetic, inflammatory, uh, venous, um, uh, osteoradian necrosis, which I don't see a lot of, but some of the, uh, the general surgeons do and the, and the family doctors do. And we also have hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which um, is just a different type of therapy that's really good for certain types of wounds. Problem being, as with all things, that insurance companies are only covering very small populations. Um, so, Interesting. Well, it was good to know. Um, so what do you see if, a, um, if you look at your current situation? Where do you want to see yourself, your practice, five years from now? Um, are, are your professional meds, needs are met already or you have some more things to accomplish? Um, that's a fantastic question. Um, I, I would say, and I'm sure, I'm sure you already know the answer to this and knowing me, um, you know, I'm never really satisfied, I guess. Um, you know, I, I thoroughly enjoy where I am, but I, I always want to, I always look to, you know, what's the next step? How can I, how can I progress, um, you know, within what I'm doing? Um, you know, one thing I, I found that I've really enjoyed doing over the last couple of years is I've, I've been uh, teaching residents um, uh, surgery at Lancel Hospital. They, um, the Roxburgh Hospital um, residency program rotates uh, with, uh, with my practice at Lansdale Hospital uh, every month. Um, I've been really enjoying um, um, getting to know them, but teaching them uh, surgical technique and um, you know, diagno diagnostics and things of that nature. So I would certainly like to do some teaching. Um, sometime um, within the next, whether it's in the next five years or just at some point, whether it's a, as a residency director or as or a professor at a, at a, at a school, because um, we have Temple University's a podiatry school uh, locally. So I would love even to be adjunct staff there. Um, the, um, you know, other things that I've been um, really getting interested in is um, that I've had a really big interest in, um, in ankle replacements and ankle implants. Um, I kind of have for my entire career, to be honest with you, but I've never really had, really never, never really, um, I didn't really do them much um, when I was a resident, so I can't, couldn't say I really felt comfortable, you know, dabbling in them um, as a, uh, you know, as a young attending. But now that I've had, you know, quite a bit of experience, you know, I, I really, I really feel that that's a thing that I can bring to the table. And it's not really something that's, you know, it's really not a thing that's done in this particular area. So I think that's a void that I can fill. Um, so I would really, you know, that's something I would really like to kind of ramp up and get going over the course of uh, the next five years. Very interesting. Um, well, we'll have to have a separate session because I have no idea how the ankle um, uh, implant or um, hardware actually, what do that even exist and what's happening. What I wanted to ask you from this uh, topic uh, into my wife is a runner and I you you are also into fitness um, do you have um, some sort of interest in uh, handling people who are otherwise healthy but they need better care of their feet because they use it too much oh yeah and that's something that I see very often in my private office I mean I know I've been focusing a lot on wound care um, you know, just cause that's just kind of, you know, where my niche has really been, particularly in the hospital system, but in my, out, in my outpatient, um, clinic, uh, I see a fairly good amount of, you know, people, you know, overuse injuries, um, you know, or people who just really just want advice on what type of shoes do I need orthotics? You know, is this something that can improve, um, either my, you know, it can just help prevent injury, you know, or I'm about to start training for a marathon and I'm starting to get this little sore soreness on the on on in my toe or something like that you know um so yeah i mean i absolutely so you could advise people on on that too because oh, most of people they probably see podiatrists when it's too late right i mean when when things have actually deformed or they have not taken care of it but having to maybe see a podiatrist if you are a runner overuse injury is likely maybe seeing six months or a yearly basis just as routine too wouldn't that be nice? Would that be better, right? Oh yeah, I mean, I think I think so. I mean, I, you know, do I think that everybody, absolutely everybody, you know, you need to if you're, you know, if you're a runner. I mean, I would say probably not. You know, I mean, I think that, you know, for, I think for those who are, um, I think for those who are just starting to get in, to get into running or get into an activity, you know, if, I find if you don't do so slowly, you know, at some point you'll be making an appointment with somebody about, you know, a foot or a leg issue because, you know, if you start, if you start to do too much too fast, things get really sore. Um, 
you know, like I, like I, I can tell you, you know, like I actually love when I get runners in my office because me, I, I will end up talking with them at a probably a little, little longer than I should just about running or training or shoes or something like that. Just cause I've always, I've always found it interesting. So I've, you know, I've been you know, a runner in one way or another, my entire, my entire life basically. So one more question, I'm going to pick your brain here and um, sure. is it happened to my sister-in-law. She has flat feet, right? Mm -hmm. All her life. Uh, she's a physician who actually went into pharmaceuticals. She's young, like 27, 28. Mm -hmm. She called us uh, three weeks ago and has a uh, fragility fracture, stress fracture, and mm -hmm. came out of nowhere. I mean, she's a little mm -hmm. bit on the heavier side, but it's really not that. And, and uh, I was like, two of my kids are flat feet. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that I think we need to look at it at early age because I think it's better. Because, doesn't it affect the arch of the foot? Yeah, yeah, flat feet absolutely affect the arch of the foot. And, it, and what it does is, you know, as your foot is flattening, it changes the stresses. On all the um, on all the bones, kind of moving uh, moving across the foot, uh, particularly uh, particularly in the forefoot, um, you know, and having flat feet can absolutely predispose you to a lot of different things, including plantar fasciitis, which is you know standardly is going to be pain in your heel um, or Achilles tendonitis, um, or certainly as we get older, um, it can tr more translate more into arthritis. Um, yeah. of, you know, of hind foot joints. Well, we have a lot of topics to discuss with you. So you have to uh, try to find time for us and our viewers. My uh, questions a little bit go deeper into now your personal struggles as a physician, um, businessman, entrepreneur, starting up your own practice. Were there any uh, roadblocks starting out this and how did you overcome? Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, to answer your question, um, to, to say there were roadblocks would probably be an understatement. Um, you know, there was, I would say that there was no person that was a roadblock. Um, you know, I, as I kind of alluded to earlier, I've been very fortunate in my career to have essentially be dealing with nothing but extremely nice professional, um, you know, administrators, uh, fellow physicians, nurses, colleagues, things of that nature. So, the, the struggles that we have were um, essentially, you know, my um, business partner and I, you know, starting a practice from basically nothing. You know, my business partner bought a practice in Percocet, but we were, we expanded, you know, almost instantaneously um, into Lansdale, uh, in the Lansdale area. Um, and the struggle, I mean, the struggles were really um, very, very much, we didn't know what we were doing. I mean, from a medical standpoint, we, we felt great. You know, we felt very confident and we were, we, we, we were very confident. We were still very good. Um, but, you know, we didn't know how do you, how do you get a refer, how do you get referral sources? How do you get patients in the door? You know, how do you, you know, th there was no thing that we knew. I mean, for, for all, I mean, we didn't really know how to code. We didn't, you know, like there's a lot of you know, insurance ins and outs that we never, I mean, things that we could never even have thought of because again, we, we didn't really have anybody that we could call on, you know, we didn't have, you know, somebody who was had, you know, 10, 15 years of experience, you know, just, you know, doing things and, um, you know, you know, doing the billing things, you know, so we were, so it was a struggle for a long time, you know, and we, you know, and then, you know, then just becoming, coming into, you know, having to break off to, you know, put on the business owner hat you know, as a, you know, so you take off the physician hat, you put on the, the business owner hat, and then you have to make a lot of really hard decisions of, you know, whether you have to, you know, let go staff or, you, have, you know, you know, you have to furlough people, you have to reduce hours because of, you know, Medicare's not, didn't pay us for six months or whatever, you know, whatever the situation is, you know, so we, you know, but the good thing is, is that my, you know, my partner, my business partner and I, uh, Warren Siegel, you know, we, we've always had a lot of trust between us because we've been friends since our first year of dietary school. You know, I've known the guy a very long time at this point. Um, and I think without that, this would have, this would have been really, really hard. Like I can absolutely, you know, cause you're talking about money. You're talking about, you know, like, can I pay myself this week? Um, can I, you know, am I going to be, you know, you know the story, I, was, I, I can actually honestly tell you, I remember feeling like I, I was back in college a little bit because I remember thinking like, man, I have got to get another job to, um, to, yeah, to, to, su to supplement my podiatry career. And that's actually what I, I actually, <laughs> I actually, you know, as an early attending, I actually ended up, um, I, I ended up um, doing, uh, emceeing a, a quiz of, or trivia at a, at a bar, uh, just as supplemental income, because, 
we, because frankly speaking, we just from a business standpoint, we were struggling, you know, and, and it's, you know, and it took us a very long time to figure out why, because again, we didn't really have anybody we could call on. Now, you know, we did have, you know, we had some other struggles, you know, with some, with some, uh, with some people that we were working, that we were working with, um, it's probably about four or five years ago that absolutely helped us a ton in terms of learning about billing, but um, I don't really want to get into the, into the details of it, but we had to leave there, uh, leave, leave that office. Um, and, you know, it's uh, so a lot of struggles of, of yeah. personal nature. But what I seem to understand from what you're telling me, you remained resilient. So what message would you give to uh, to folks listening to you, people, young medical students who are on their path? Is there any message that comes out of this? Yeah, I mean, I think the message is that, you know, if you as long as it, let's put it like this, as long as you continue to do a good job, okay, I mean, you got, you have to be, a, you have to be a good physician first. I mean, period. If you, if you're not good at your job, then the money's not going to come. Yeah. But if you're a good physician, as long as you are a likable person, you're, you're, you're nice to people. There's no reason to yell. There's never a reason to yell at people. Um, you know, always be available. Never say no to work. Okay. You never, you know, if someone mistreated you as a resident, you know, or, or something like that, just put it in the back of your head because you never know when that might be a referral source or maybe you'll buy their practice in 10 years. You have no idea. Yeah. So there's never a reason to burn a bridge. And um, the other is, you know, <sighs> my phrase is, there's two, two big pieces of advice that I actually give to all the residents that rotate with me. One is, um, I do not recommend as a standard doing things the way that myself and uh, Dr. Siegel did things. Um, it was really, it was very difficult. Um, it was um, probably unnecessarily difficult. Uh, I'm, I'm thrilled now, like I'm very happy now, but you know, there was a large part of the last 10 years where I was less thrilled. And um, you know, it's a, I think that if you could learn how to bill as an associate of somewhere, you know, like get a job, somewhere where you have something established with guaranteed money and you learn how to bill and you want to branch off on your own after two or three years, that's okay. Because now you have, now you know what to do, you know how to bill. And I mean, you know, I'm sure as you're as aware as I am, you, you're never done learning about billing. Like billing is very bizarre. It's very complex. Um, but, um, but if you kind of learn how to do it on somebody else's dime, you know, they have a vested interest in you billing. So they're going to teach you what to do. Um, and the, uh, and I'd say, and, and the other is again, just um, make sure that you are, you're always, make sure you're always available. Never say, never say no to work. Um, because I mean, the second, you know, the second you say no to work, someone else down the street is going to be just thrilled to get that work. So. That's absolutely right. That's oh, wow. Um, I want to tell you that this is something that, uh, people actually don't realize, but all the words that you said, actually, I think if people keep telling them uh, every, every day, start of the day, they would never make anybody unhappy and their business will increase several folds. That's how much important what you said, never uh, burn your bridges, never s say no to work and be good at what you do, be, be your heart in it. And that's money will follow. So with yeah. that, I am going to say that um, uh, as, as you are a young father too, mm. the work and life balance and physician burnout is a big problem in our uh, profession. How are you handling that? I mean, no, no one is perfect. I don't do mm. it right. Nobody does it. it. How do you do it? What's your formula so that people can listen and hear? So, you know, I, you know, my, <laughs> the, I'll put to you like this. I, I like you do not probably do it right. I would say that, and my wife would agree that I, I work too much, that um, I need to do a better job of uh, balancing work and life. Um, I, you know, I think I make a very concerted effort uh, to leave work at work. As in, um, you know, I'm not going to come home and 
bust open my computer and continue my day is that when my day is is done unless i'm on call that's a, that, that's a totally different scenario nothing i can do about that phone calls happen things happen nothing nothing to be done there but you know i try to be when i'm home i'm home i'm there with my with my kids um i'm there with um my wife my dogs you know i'm trying to i'm trying to relax i go i, I usually i like to either go running or i like to you know um, like work out in some way um, and then, and honestly, just try to um, just have family time because, you know, you know, I, I get, you know, when you get home a little bit later, you know, as, as any working person knows, I mean, like you, the, the time that you have with your family is, you know, it's precious and it's limited. And, you know, that's, well, that, I mean, those are the types of things like I, I try to, I, I try to do and whether I succeed to varying degrees, depending on the day. Well, I, I want to admire you for admitting the fact that you're not perfect and neither am I. And I want to dig deeper into it in our next session, which is our fun session, where we'll go deeply a little bit about how you, um, how do you um, have fun with your family. With that, sure. thank you so much. We'll conclude our professional session here today. Sure. And, uh, we'll, thank you. and viewers, stay tuned for the next uh, part, which is the fun part with Dr. Evan Chachelli. Thank you.